Hello and welcome to Adventures with ADHD Season 2, where we get more in depth with our conversations. And I'd love to welcome back today, Nikki Butler. Hi, Nikki. Thanks for coming. Oh, hi. Thank you so much. It's it's amazing to be back. Hey. I love so, the first part. It was brilliant. It was so much fun. <laughs> so thank you, Nikki. Um, what we're talking about today is really, really fascinating stuff. A lot of the time people ask, what are the benefits of getting a diagnosis? Well, Nikki's story today um, should really answer that question. We're talking about how Nikki's diagnosis helped her in her recent hospital visit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it, it, it helped you cope then? Yes, it was really interesting because obviously I've had like 11 other surgeries and some other minor four or five other minor procedures and I've always had really bad anxiety I've never coped very well but when I went into hospital I just said right in fact I said right from my pre-assessment appointment I'm autistic um with ADHD and what that means for me is I can really struggle so I can struggle to understand in terms of what you're telling me I can become overwhelmed I'm not always aware of where the pain is in my body and I'll panic because something doesn't feel right and I won't know what that is and so what I need from you is to understand that about me and to also if I'm panicking because something doesn't feel right you'll need to ask me some specific questions to help me connect maybe with you know do you feel dizzy? Do you feel sick? Have you got pain in your back? Is Have you got pain in your legs? So basically, I was, re I was able to say, I will need you to communicate this and I will feel overwhelmed. So please don't kind of tell me lots of information at once. Um, I told them I wasn't very good with junior members of staff. Um, and they had a new computer system the day, literally the day that I went in. And outside my room a few of them were debating the fact that they didn't know where information was they couldn't basically didn't know what was going on and I I basically said could you shut my door please because this is causing me a lot of anxiety I'm having surgery but now I'm worrying that I'm going to be given the wrong medication or my notes won't be available and and actually just being able to say this is how I am this is how I experience things and this is what I need from you and I was really lucky because from the Wednesday until um, the early hours of the Saturday morning, my my medical team were unbelievable. They were so kind. They couldn't do enough for me. They were really understanding because I knew that I was quite like I was challenging in the you know the things that affect me maybe didn't affect other people, and they genuinely could not do enough for me. Oh. When the and I was discharged on the Saturday. Um, lunchtime but the Saturday morning when the weekend staff came in not interested n n told me they hadn't been told that I was autistic ADHD -er. I'd heard the conversation where they had been told they were outside my door and they'd explained she gets overwhelmed like this is what you need to do with her she's absolutely fine but take this into account no we haven't been told that because the woman was really stressing me out she was in and out and in and out and I didn't know what was going on I didn't know where my meds were didn't know where my mum was and, and I was like, look, I'm not trying to be difficult, but have the medical team explain this to you? No. And what difference does that make anyway? What? And so I was glad to, to be discharged yeah. on the um, on the Saturday. But then I went to stay with my parents for six weeks. So for me, not having my routine, my food, my environment, I thought, oh, my God, this is going to spiral me. But because my mum now is kind of, completely accepting and tries to understand like my ASD and ADHD and I kept telling myself so from our coaching sessions you know when you know even with me having my breakfast when I was gonna I changed my breakfast and wanted to make a backup breakfast in case yeah. I there were even things like that that I was like okay so this isn't what you'd normally experience that's not the food you'd normally eat that's not how you prepare it yeah. um because I couldn't prepare my own food, couldn't even freaking get out of bed. And so I just kept saying, so what? So so what's the worst that's going to happen? And mm. okay, so mum didn't prepare that food exactly how you would. So what? Like, oh. and I, 
and I caught myself a few times with my rehab and I'm still doing it where I'm creating almost like strict rules and obsessive patterns but some days are better than others mm. and I've had to kind of go you're doing too much like I've had to really try and listen and get out of that yesterday you did that many steps so you've got to do it today and you did your physio you did this in this order yeah. and to, to stop and go you don't have to do the same every day or more every day it was that you've got to do a bit more so I've really been able to kind of watch my own patterns yes. and it doesn't cause me as much anxiety like even things like I would always get up have my two coffees um, do some reading have a shower have my breakfast like it's the same routine it's just it you know that's just how it is but some mornings I'm like I just want to have my breakfast before I have a shower and I've let myself do it wow. and and those things seem really small but um, for me they're so huge and I don't get anxious about like the fact I've, I've made those little changes in my routine yeah. and I've cut loads of people out of my life which I know sounds brutal but I've cut loads of people out of my life where I was like I'm just not there for it for you anymore because I realised they were just draining me when it suited them. No, they they weren't in contact with me. They weren't interested in supporting me, and so I could look at patterns where I'd almost behaved in a "that's what a friend does" from my side of it, going, "You need to follow these rules." Yeah, and I just thought rather than being angry with the people that weren't reciprocating, I'm like, I don't need people like that in my life, and that's okay. That doesn't say. It's not a broken set of rules. It's just resetting boundaries and releasing. Boundaries. Don't respect them. It's been really interesting to just. Wow. And I and I think I remember saying to you that I. So I never really thought. What did I think? So I, I kind of I remember thinking, what will a diagnosis and a formal diagnosis mean for me? And I see this a lot that comes up for other people, where they debate like, well, it won't mean anything. And it has for me actually. So my, it's enabled me to really understand and communicate who I am and what I need. My, I said to you, my autism, so it was a bit of a funny situation for me. My autism diagnosis was out of the blue and it came from the ADHD psychiatrist who was very kind about it, but it did knock me for six. And he said, he diagnosed um, ASD, but said, you're going to have to go back through the formal loop because you need two separate reports. Um, only our medical system could be uh, quite as draconian as that. But I was really lucky. It was, I think for my area, it was a three or four wait for adult services. And I was referred in February, got rejected because they ignored the um, ADHD report re-referred in April and then got fast-tracked so my I've already had you know all of the multi-form filling but I've had my uh my first assessment with the psychiatrist a couple of weeks ago my second one is this Sunday so the the two that I've already seen have confirmed ASD but you I have to have the next one to have the before I get the report and I thought god what difference does that make but it is huge it's 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 bigger than I thought it would be to have the formal diagnosis because it's it's just helped me to understand a lot more and it's more rather than me thinking is that me and actually some of that might be societal mm -hmm. you know where people are very dismissive and yeah it helps me feel like I can I have the ability to ask for support yeah. and can produce a I know it's silly but re produce a report to to back up the fact I need the support well yeah because some people will be very open and some will not like like you just said about the hospital so you know to have that backup and say this is what I need this isn't just you know not making stuff up here this is a genuine need yeah there's nothing more powerful than that I don't think no and i funnily enough i've actually got this this is that makes me laugh this really made me laugh because i'm like how 
for me, it epitomised my ADHD. I applied, when we started working together, I applied for a PIP. And I forgot. <laughs> I applied for it. And I got a message yesterday saying, your recent PIP. And I'm like, and it wasn't. It was a few months ago. But there, And I've got my appointment this afternoon. But I was like, for me, like how that that is just the epitome of how things are for me. I just forget. Uh -huh. um, but that's really important because I don't, I'm self-employed now. My surgery has left my circumstances, you know, di very different. And, and I just thought at some point I might have to be an employee. And then I will need, the likelihood is I will need to produce a report to officially be able to get the support that I need. And, and that for me will be things like, you know, sensory overwhelm is immense. Like being around too many people with too bright lights, with too much noise. And, you know, oh. it's not a coincidence. I work on my own in my clinic and my, PA is virtual because I don't want somebody else with me so I'm like those things are really I don't necessarily think it should be like that mm. but it gives me the comfort of knowing if my circumstances change mm. I have what I need to validly expect support uh, support does okay. that make sense it's like, and I didn't think I'd feel that way yeah well that's the thing you can never really predict how you're going to feel about anything can you and there's always going to be extra things and the fact that you were able to advocate for yourself in that hospital situation um you know before without that language you know it could have been I'm sure very different and it had been for me so you know I'd had some big big surgeries where I was really unwell and I can tell you countless times where I just go something's not right something's not right and I would full-on panic attack in the hospital they would be getting consultants I would be screaming something's not right something's not right and I never knew what that was and it was because I just had this overwhelming feeling that something wasn't right but my I think it's called if I remember right it's interoception I don't connect to what is wrong where is it wrong what am I feeling in those moments it's this overwhelming panic and interestingly you you might remember how bad my anxiety attacks and panic were mm. when we were working together despite the fact that I've just been through major spinal surgery I haven't had one proper panic attack wow. not not one so wow. I think the power of my diagnosis is uh, is probably it, it I guess it's it's highlighted to me the root cause of a lot of my anxiety was not knowing why did I feel this way why did other people not seem to react that way or feel that way and it's yeah to not have had like a major panic I had little moments of oh I feel I feel weird I feel weird and then I would just come back to you've had morphine you feel a bit dizzy you've not eaten so I could yeah. come back from it which I've never been able to do before um and that has been the power in knowing why that it's that way for me it's been huge yeah yeah like life-changing amazing honestly it's just so good to hear because this is kind of what it's all about isn't it finding out what what's going on for you but also yeah why why you acted the way you did all those times and I feel very calm about it and I and I have like when we were working together I've gone through and I'm still very much going through these roller coasters of um grief and sadness yeah. and definitely some anger and not anger at anyone in particular but I think it's because life has always felt so difficult, so challenging and so isolating, there is a part of me that thinks, God, if I yeah. had known all of this before, what could I or would I have done differently? Like, I certainly wouldn't have been in some of the jobs that I've been in. I would not have had the, the, the people in my life I, that I'd had in my life. And I think actually after my first um asd assessment with the psychiatrist a lot of the questions he was asking me i was like shit i didn't realize that 
that that, that was part of my ASD and it, it has been a roller coaster of you know I'm glad I can recognize it and get the help but at 46 like the impact it's had on my life and and coming to terms with that and processing that it's that balance of now I can have a better happier life going forward but I do think there's a part of me that's grieving for the experiences that I've had and maybe not had yeah yeah really interesting I didn't think it would affect me in this way both in the positives and in the some of the you know the trauma feelings I need to go through but that's all part of the power I think a part of the the journey yeah yeah no it's 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 just amazing and yeah there is there is grief there and you know that can take time to process um with this you know what could have been but we never really know what could have been but it's yeah. still all valid you have yeah. to feel those those feelings of sadness and anger yeah gosh and with kindness though I think now so before I would probably have berated myself and thought why don't why don't you fit in what are you doing that no one else is doing like why can't you just you know that that conversation with myself if only you could or why can't you just but I have so much more empathy and compassion for myself now and kindness and even in the moments where I do things that are maybe a little bit jarring or I can see somebody else's reaction to me is like I have kindness and compassion for myself in those moments and if I can see, like, from a really obvious reaction, that like, I might go, what, what, what did I say or what did I do? I will try and, I don't always recognise it, but I will try and temper it and go, oh, sorry, did I, did I, maybe I didn't phrase that well. Um, I don't always, I don't feel the need to say um, I'm autistic, but I have that compassion for myself and the ability to maybe yeah maybe not try and overcorrect as much yeah good good because there's so there's too much overcorrecting going on isn't there like going your whole life well my whole life undiagnosed always apologizing or worrying that I've hurt someone's feelings because of their reaction yeah. and it can be ever so slight can't it but you see it and you're like oh what have I said and then you're kind of replaying God, yeah uh, how did that sound and it's just too much it's exhausting and yeah to to give yourself kindness and compassion and not have yeah. to deal with going over it and over it again look you didn't mean any harm you know i didn't mean any harm i'm a good person so you know if they, if they haven't asked me to explain then forget it you know and that's the thing, isn't it? Like often, like the rumination and the like playing the conversation over and I should have said, I should have done differently. And oh my God. And you tell yourself this story, this whole backstory, which has got, you know, I don't know about you, but for me, it's like multi-sensory and I get hot flushes and a panic and, and I'm telling myself this story that they've told themselves and what they must think of me. And then what do I need to do to correct it? And I've done it before I've apologized to somebody and they don't even know what I'm on about. No. And I'm like, oh, that's awkward. Cause now I've, now I've like <laughs> now I've got to talk about this. Oh, now no. I've said, oh my god, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I, that I upset you. But what with what? And then I'll say, well, when I said that thing, what? I, oh no, I didn't take it. Then I'm going, oh my god, I'm really sorry. I, I, and then it's just like this spiral, and then that conversation Never gets played ending. on loop. And yeah, um, you know, uh, and I think it's it is exhausting. And I think I think that's why I feel really strongly about the issue of masking. Mm. You know, how many of us subconsciously like for all those years mask because society deems what's acceptable and what's not but that that kind of what do we do to ourselves and put ourselves through to try and be acceptable or accepted or that normal which you know all that stuff is like I'm really trying to let go of apologizing for who I am and hiding who I am yes yeah yeah because it's it like it just be, it's a natural it becomes natural to cover up and hide and then once you realise you're doing it, it's like, yeah, hold on, why should I hide myself? So it's like trying to unhide or, and unmask, isn't it? And it's, I still find yeah. myself doing it now. But I think the difference is the awareness and catching. Yeah. And like, ah, okay, this is happening. That's 
I don't think without that awareness, it's very hard to kind of grow and progress, isn't it? Yeah, and I'm really careful to make sure I don't say, oh, God, sorry, I'm autistic. I'm not sorry about that at all. Yeah. Or, yeah. or if I forget something or I'm, you know, I'm like 3,000 variations of a conversation away from where we were all the time. But I never say, oh, God, sorry, that's my ADHD or um, sorry, I'm autistic. I'm like, I'm not sorry for it. It's not, it's not a flaw. It's who I am. And I'm really conscious. I think in the beginning pre-diagnosis when I knew that that's kind of where everything was going for me I think I probably was saying sorry sorry I'm you know and I'm now I'm like no I'm not sorry at all like I will accommodate you you accommodate me we're two human beings with different needs and different ways of being we're equal yeah but actually yeah. I've got a really creative brain so yeah um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to apologize for that I'm like the way that I think is like pretty awesome sometimes yeah. but, I, it, but equally I'm not going to apologize and some of that is very much around the language and I have a massive issue with it is it's labeled a disability and I totally get that for some people ASD is a disability and you oh, know yeah. I totally get that for some people that they have very different support needs for me but um, I don't look at my ASD or ADHD as a disability. I look at it as like my superpower, but that in some situations I need different support, but that also I need to be mindful of the situations I put myself in. Yeah. That's yeah. a big thing, isn't it? When you realise, when I, you know, like I talked to you about work, when you realise that try and force yourself into work environments or social situations that it actually doesn't matter what you do or what you put in place it's not you're not being kind to yourself and that's okay to like that's a big thing I'm like I don't I'm learning like what's okay with me and what's not yeah um and not being in triggering environments or with triggering people yeah that's that's been quite huge yeah and I think that is the kind of the disabling aspect isn't it when people are kind of forced into environments that are not good for them whether that's in school yeah whether that's you know later on in life then it it becomes disabling you know if it's sense you know sensorily sensory yeah. overwhelm people places meltdowns and I think that's yeah. the where it comes into the disability aspect. yeah because we're all it's but then I think for me I feel like that's just a huge societal issue that that everything is geared up towards well I guess what what is kind of considered socially acceptable and the environments for that are not diverse oh, yeah. and and that's where it's a uh, you know it shouldn't be that all that, that that's the schools are a classic aren't they there's one way of learning one way of being and you know if you have asd support needs like it's almost obvious that they, they kind of make it mm. make children feel like they're not normal and don't fit in and i wish that it could be different whereas like business environments or social situations or schools where it's just that certain students or certain people have different support needs and that is all normal yeah and that's okay you know yeah and yeah some some will have higher support needs but yeah. that's okay yeah and, then... and that's okay and, I, and my issue is where it is where it is it almost like causes a like a, a an obvious difference or it, it for me it just compounds situations like I already feel uncomfortable in a certain environment but because then my support needs make me obvious where the last thing I want to do is stand out yeah. and those support needs you know it's it's not readily available or it really separates me from you know the bulk of not society I suppose it is really isn't it that's where it, where it becomes you know I think negative because to step out of the this is what is normal makes you look like what makes me feel like I don't fit in I'm like that but that's not right yeah really it's I'm just trying to navigate all of this and think I 
I want to feel really positive about everything. I don't want to keep coming up against environments and people and situations where just because I'm not neurotypical, I feel like I don't belong. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a, not a constant battle. That sounds quite overwhelming. But once you have the knowledge, it you it's there and you have the language and you have the the you know it's not well I guess it is our because we have the language I mean because I have the language sorry I'm not talking for you um I feel I'm in a good position to kind of help others that don't are not quite there with able able to express themselves um so for us to be yeah. able lead the way a bit and make things a bit better for others does that make sense I'm not sure yeah I'm... and that's really really what I want to do I, and I think I'm still on this very it's very early for me mm. and trying to kind of navigate everything and understand it and make everything a bit softer and more inclusive and celebrate like all of the qualities that ASD and, ASD and ADHD bring um and I but I am still very much learning all of that you know before my ADHD assessment I hadn't even crossed my mind or been a consideration wow. that I was autistic mm. and that's the been the bit that I've had to kind of challenge my own perception yeah. of ASD and, and and what that means and the fact that it impacts every single person differently every single person like you know, my biggest bugbear is when people say you don't look autistic or you don't look like you've got ADHD. I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, what it's... are you even saying to me? Like, uh, I um, say that to you. <laughs> but I get it. Like, there's no way you're autistic. You don't look autistic. Um, uh, <laughs> and then I just, but. And I have to, I don't bite anymore, but I, but I would have bitten before, but I'm adding like, what? Like, how do you know? But now I just think, I've actually said to a close friend, okay, firstly, what does, what does ASD or ADHD look like? And then they get stumped because yes. they don't want to tell me, you know, that they watched Rain Man or that, you know, they're thinking about, I guess, the, the stereotypical young boy running around type rap. So they don't want to tell me that, but then they don't know what to say. Yeah. Um, but then I tend to say to people, what do you know about how I live my life and how I think and how I feel? What do, tell me what you know. And they know nothing, like literally nothing. Um, even my mum didn't know about my routines from the minute I get up, and, you know, but it's my biggest thing of like, you don't look autistic or like you've got ADHD. I'm like, which is why, you know, I've always really wanted to speak up, like ever since I've 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 had my diagnosis of ADHD, because I'm like, if that is what people are thinking and saying, we've got to change that, right? We've got to Yeah. Gotta stand up and go, well, this is what it looks like. And no two people are the same. And no one person is necessarily the same in two similar environments. You know, I can I can be affected by different things. I One day I could be in a situation I might cope better than the next day where I've got sensory overload or exhaustion. Or So you might see me in the same place acting very differently on two different days. Yeah. Yeah, it's so complex. It's very dismissive when people say, oh, you don't look, you don't look autistic <laughs> or... <laughs> what does that even mean oh, i mean yeah <laughs> that's a good question what does that even mean and also oh but everyone does that you know it's like we're all a little oh. bit autistic that's the other thing we're all a little bit autistic we're not we're not no. um i've got an adhd video that i share when people say to me you know if i try and talk about adhd oh i do that oh, i do that oh, i do that i'm like yeah, it's executive functioning. Everybody like will lose something sometimes. Everybody will forget something sometimes, or your brain might be busy. Whatever that is, I'm like, but if you've got ADHD, 
like multiply that by a thousand all of the time and it affects your life yes and there's a great video that was a um a, i think he was a neurologist that explains adhd beautifully it's about a 30 minute video and he explains it really beautifully and about what happens in the brain and and talks about the fact that people go oh yeah that happens to me oh, that happens to me um i mean i've got people going i must have adhd then because i do that what because that one time you lost your keys and you forgot a doctor's appointment <laughs> yes you set yes. up thirty thousand reminders for everything you need to do because otherwise out of your brain yeah. um but i send this video to people now because it's exhausting trying to explain it and having those conversations of me too me too um and he and i just go watch this <laughs> yeah yeah nikki thank you so much for coming along and talking to me and sharing your story it's been lovely seeing you again Thank you. It's such a pleasure. And I am sure that we'll do more episodes together. Absolutely. <laughs>